right, what a joy to be here this evening with you. We look forward to camp meeting. My family, my kids talk about it all year long. And this is one of them. I forget which one says this is greater than Christmas. Now, obviously, they mean how we celebrate Christmas. Hour, but, but they love camp meeting. and so glad to see you all here this evening. And what a joy it is to come together. And yes, we're not being blown away this year. That time last year was something else. So obviously, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Habakkuk. We'll try to introduce this book and, and give a, some thoughts on the first chapter. Do you ever struggle with why God allows difficult things to happen? We look out and about and we see certain things and we say why. We are no different than Habakkuk. We might try to pretend we're spiritual and not ask the questions, but we do in our minds. So many confusing things happen in this life, in the lives of others. We see so much injustice in the world. It's hard to turn the news on, right? Because there is a, a lot of injustice in the world. Why doesn't God just judge them? Why does God let this go? We are no different than Habakkuk. If we're honest with ourselves. We can all struggle with these things because we're human. God said in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God knows what he's doing. God is truly sovereign. We need to learn to be okay with the perplexities of life and the confusions of life. And this book will help us with that. Habakkuk was struggling. He was perplexed. And often so are we. And so this little book can help us to be okay with God's mysteries and his all-wise ways. Now, as an introduction, a very small book, three chapters, 56 verses, and 13, uh, 1,373 words. Not a very big book at all. We, we look at the prophet himself. We know very little about Habakkuk. There's not much said about him. That's not really uncommon. Many of the prophets we know little about. His name may be from a Hebrew meaning to encircle or to embrace. Uh, Martin Luther suggests that it meant that the prophet would embrace the people. But I, I disagree. I think with the context of the book, I think it would better fit the understanding that the prophet is learning to cling to God, to embrace God, through the perplexities and trials of life. Habakkuk was a contemporary with Jeremiah and Ezekiel and probably uh, Daniel. Leon would suggest that he may have even teamed up with Jeremiah. I don't know, but that was a suggestion. But the date and setting in the book, most likely around or slightly before 605 B.C., shortly before the Babylonian invasion, he talks about the Chaldeans coming. Uh, they would be the judgment that God would use. Now we'll see Nebuchadnezzar, the son of Nebuchadnezzar. He comes in three stages uh, in Israel's history, 605 B.C., 597, and then following in 586 B.C. Again, chapter 1, verses 6 through 10 reveal the imminent invasion that they are coming. There is no mention of Assyria suggesting that Nineveh was already destroyed, and that took place right around 612 B.C., so uh, somewhere between 612 and probably pretty close to, to 605 uh, right before the Babylonians come. The language and sins mentioned are not in keeping with Josiah's reforms, but fit quite well with the wicked reign of Jehoiakim, who reigned from 609 to 598 B.C. Others suggest the time of Manasseh, but that really doesn't fit. Uh, again, there's no mention of Assyria, so I, I think we can confidently say it's the time of Jehoiakim. It's right before the Babylonians are coming to conquer and I think uh, somewhere shortly before 605 B.C. would make the most sense. The days of revival and peace and prosperity of Josiah, they're gone. And what a precious time in Josiah's reign where he brought the nation back to God. And 
had a great revival, but as we read through the book, those times are, are gone. Wickedness and violence abound. Anxiety and distress uh, overtake many. Josiah's reforms are overturned and they are ignored and the majority of the people are reverted back to the conditions of Ammon and Manasseh. And so we see some, some uh, wicked times here for Israel, which is causing Habakkuk's perplexity of why God is allowing this. What is the purpose of the book? Well, th this, this book is quite different than many of the other pro prophetic writings. Because it's primarily a conversation between the prophet and God. We are privileged to, to listen to this conversation as Habakkuk asks these questions and God answers him. Revelation is given by God answering the prophet's questions. The prophet is perplexed, as we'll see in chapter 1. And he's perplexed over several things. Number one, why is God seemingly ignoring Israel's sins? Wickedness abounds. It bothers Habakkuk. And he's wondering, why does God allow this? He, he, he understands God to be a holy God. And so how can a holy God allow all of this wickedness and sin? Where is justice? But number two, he seems to be perplexed too because God seems to not be answering him. He feels that God is ignoring his prayers about the nation's sins. Now God obviously is not ignoring him, but it seems to the prophet that God is not hearing. We'll see that in a moment. And then thirdly, why will God use a nation more wicked than themselves to punish Judah? He will have some real struggles in this book, but he will come to grips with them. Now for the people of Habakkuk's day, this letter would reveal a coming judgment. But I think more importantly, the letter was also to encourage the remnant to mature in their faith and to realize they can endure the coming judgment. It's coming, but they can endure it. This short book packs really quite a punch for as small as it is. It teaches God is sovereign and he's all wise. God knows what he is doing. And therefore we must trust him in spite of what we see in spite of what we might think, we have to learn to put our faith and trust in God that he knows what he is doing. Let us worship God for who he is. We don't have to understand everything, but you know, it's hard for us, isn't it? Because we like to have answers. And it's hard for us sometimes not to find the answers that we so badly want. And I had a professor who he would always say to us, let God be God. You don't have to know everything. You can't know everything. And sometimes we just simply have to let God be God and put our trust in him. So what are some of the themes in this book? May I suggest for a main theme, as I thought through this and as I read through the book, maybe this could be a main theme here, cultivating a life of faith in the midst of perplexity and confusion. Again, cultivating a life of faith in the midst of perplexity and confusion. The prophet, as we'll see, had faith. He wasn't faithless. He had theological knowledge of God. He talks about God's holiness. He had, he had quite an understanding of God in many ways. But he struggled with maybe what we would call a puzzled faith. He was perplexed. Again, not a lack of faith, but just a perplexed faith. And honestly, we struggle with that at times too. God will test our faith and see if we can simply trust him when we don't understand. Will we trust him? Now, for some other themes throughout this book, we'll see things like the depth of faith and obedience are vital. God will use corrective discipline towards those he loves. God will judge those who mistreat his people. God is sovereign and holy. Provision of salvation and deliverance is a theme in chapter 3, in verse 8, 13, in verse 18. And there are others, other themes that I'm sure will be touched upon when we have our other speakers go through the chapters that we will look at this weekend. The layout of the book is 
And I've seen so many different layouts. Let me suggest something that may be helpful. Chapter one is we see concern and confusion. We see the prophet's concern about Israel's sin and that confusion when God says, I will take care of it, just not the way you expected. And along with that, then, we will see invasion of the Chaldeans. And chapter 2 is, is basically uh, God's response. God will judge the Chaldeans. Yes, he will use them to judge Israel, but he will also judge them for their uh, extreme mistreatment of the nation. And then chapter 3, we have Habakkuk's prayer of faith and trust. And so what we actually observe as you go through chapter 1 to chapter 3 is you observe a journey really from confusion to a more mature faith. From perplexity to learning to trust God. And so we'll unfold these things as we work through these chapters um, this weekend. But let's take a look with chapter 1. And let's begin to look at the confusion of the prophet. And I entitled chapter 1 for, for me here is a prophet's confusion. And we'll see first of all in verse 1 a vision of judgment. Uh, verse 1, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. And so right away we are introduced here with this word a burden. And it is a word in the Hebrew that can mean a heavy weight, but also here an utterance or a prophetic message. But this kind of prophetic message is one of a judgment, a divine message consisting of a negative proclamation of judgment. That judgment will come. God is giving him back a here divine revelation of coming judgment on both Judah, but as we'll see, also on the Chaldeans themselves. Robertson writes, quote, Habakkuk's prophecy possesses a burdensome dimension from start to finish, unquote. And so this revelation came through either a dream or a vision. Uh, God chose to speak to him that way. Now, I think we're all mature enough in here to realize God doesn't speak to us through dreams and visions anymore. Hebrews chapter 1, but God speaks to us through his word. But obviously in that day, God had a variety of ways of which he would give his revelation. So now let's look at verses 2 and 4. Here is a cry for God's intervention. And follow with me as I read verses 2 through 4. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry? And thou wilt not hear, even cry unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. We see here in this beginning verses, verses 2 through 4, a cry for God's intervention. Life is confusing and perplexing at times, but it is never out of the control of God. God is sovereign and always in control. And again, we have to remind ourselves when we are perplexed and we don't understand why God allows things or does things, we must simply let God be God. But the prophet here, like many of us, is distressed. He's burdened with all the sin that he sees around him. And sin ought to burden us. It ought to be a problem to us. But he sees the extreme wickedness that is all around him. And he's greatly bothered. He's distressed with all of this sin. Violence and cruelty and justice. And with the apparent success of the wicked. That's an age old question. You'll see in, in the Psalms and other places where it seems like the wicked prosper. And yet those who do righteous seem to lose out. Or so it seems. The prophet is crying out. He's, he's crying out with despair. Verse 2. Oh Lord how long shall I cry. And thou will not hear. A desperate cry to God. He wants to see God judge. He wants to see God act. Do something about this wickedness. And yet to the prophet. It seems like God's not listening. You ever been there? 
praying about something for a long, long time. God, are you listening? Do you hear me? And so he's perplexed. Why is God not listening to me? Why is, not, why is God not doing something about this wickedness? How long will he ignore my request? Or how long until you respond and deliver us from all of this evil? But let me, let me challenge you. With all of the distress and struggle the prophet is having, you notice he never gives up crying out to God. And he keeps crying out to God. He never stops turning to God. Unfortunately, at times when people feel that God is no longer listening to them or, or working on their behalf, they'll turn away from God. And yet the prophet shows us that even though it seems like God does not hear, by faith we keep crying out because God is listening. In verse 3, he says, Why dost thou show me iniquity? And cause me to behold grievance, for spoiling and violence are before me. And there are those who raise up strife and contention. Why does all of this sin that he observes continue on and God does nothing about it? He sees iniquity, all of this sorrow and mischief. He sees grievance, a word for affliction or general difficulties, general hardships. The word spoil and violence and oppression, destruction. He sees violence. Uh, the word here in the King James for violence is really the idea of violating God's moral law, his ethical wrongs, the, the idea of injuring others. And then he says there's strife and conflict. They're escalating. They're increasing. We see that today, don't we? All around us. Injustice, violence, people getting away with things, and it's increasing more and more every day. All around us. In verse 4, he says, Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceeded. He's saying, really, the law is paralyzed in its usage. It's, it's ignored by the Judeans. They, they don't use it. They did not practice true justice, therefore justice never comes about. The wicked surround and they dominate. They take advantage and mistreat the righteous. And again, we see a lot of that today around us. Habakkuk just does not understand how a holy God can ignore all of this sin and allow all of this injustice. Now, he's been crying out to God for some time. We can imply here. He's about to get an answer that he never expected. And when we come to verses 5 through 11, we see God's surprising, unexpected answer. And it certainly will surprise the prophet. Now, we can feel like the prophet. We can look out and say, Lord, why? Why all of this? Well, we're going to find out God was listening, and God was hearing his prayer, and God had a plan. Just not exactly the way they desired it. Verse 5 let me read verses 5 through 11. Behold, behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses also are swifter than leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall come from afar. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteneth to eat. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. And they shall scoff at the kings and the princes shall be scorned unto them. They shall deride every young stronghold. For they shall heap dust and take it. And then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this his power unto his God. God's surprising, unexpected answer. See, God was not idle. God was not indifferent like Habakkuk thought. He was already working out a reaction to Judah's sins. God was not going to ignore it. We always have to remind ourselves God's timing is not our timing. He, he is all wise. He has a better timing than we do. 
He tells both Habakkuk and the people to look beyond themselves. Look out to the nations. Again, look at verse 5. He says, Behold ye among the heathen. Look out amongst the nations and regard and wonder marvelously. He says, look out. There's a political power that is starting to rise in prominence. What God was doing would astound them, will bewilder them, and will dumbfound or stun them. He says, I'll work a work in your days that you will not believe, though it be told you. And so verse 6, For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans. Could you imagine being Habakkuk at this point? And all of a sudden God says, I'm going to answer. And I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. That bitter and hasty nation which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. But we must remember, verse 6 in the beginning, God says, I will raise them up. I am the one doing this. This is going to be judgment, but I'm going to be in control of this judgment. God reminds Habakkuk that he is working with this bitter and fierce and Hasty or swift people. They're going to conquer many territories. Verse 7. They are terrible and dreadful. They're fearsome. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed from themselves. Um, they are a law unto themselves. They don't care what other people do and other nations do. They're going to do whatever it is they want to do. The Judeans refuse to fear God, but they will experience fear when the Chaldeans come. You know, we better learn to truly fear God. Because if we don't, God will bring circumstances in our lives so that we will learn to fear Him. And here, they're going to experience fear. They refuse to fear God, but the nation of Judah will have great fear when the Babylonians come storming through and do their damage. In verse 8, their horses also are swifter than leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horsemen shall come from afar. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteneth to eat. This, this language, a picture is presented to us. The Babylonians will conquer with great speed and great fierceness. They won't even know what hit them. And it, will be, it will be quite the experience for them. Verse 9. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. They are truly a war machine. Their faces, the idea they're eager for war. They are quick advancing, and they're an extremely effective army. They know what they're doing. And they have their face set at destroying the Judeans. They're going to collect many captives and it's not going to be a pretty sight in verse 10 and they shall scoff at the kings and the princes shall be a scorn unto them they shall deride every stronghold for they shall heap dust and take it then shall his mind change and he shall pass over and offend imputing this his power unto his god in verse 10 they will laugh at kings and their so-called strongholds that's nothing for the babylonians and they will pile up earth and rubble, and they'll take these fortified cities like it's nothing. In verse 11, the, the Hebrew, in verse 11, anybody really studies this verse in depth, they realize it's a little challenging here. And, and when it says that he shall change his mind, now understand this, this word mind here most often means spirit, breath, or wind. And I think here he's talking and using an illustration really of when it's not, in my opinion, as I study this, he's not changing his mind about something. I think we should read it a little differently here. Most likely what is being said is the Babylonians will pass through Judah and the surrounding areas like the wind that causes its damage and then just continues on. The word change in the King James is a verb that also means to pass by or to pass through. And so they're going to come, and they're going to pass through all these areas, including Judah, and they're just going to take captives, and they're just going to take over the land, and they're going to keep going, and they're going to keep on conquering. 
They are fierce, they are quick, they are ruthless. Now, again, you can imagine Habakkuk. God says, basically here, I heard your prayer. And this is what I'm going to do about the injustice of Israel. I'm going to send the Babylonians. What a message. And you know he wasn't expecting that. God finally answers them, and it's with this message. So how will he now respond? In verses uh, 12 through really chapter 2, verse 1, we have here more confusion and learning to come to grips with God's truth. And so here's Habakkuk's response. He says in verse 12, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not be idle, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment, and O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Let's just stop there for a second. I can imagine just for a moment Habakkuk's a little bit speechless as he tries to come to grips with this message. The Babylonians are coming and they're going to be God's arm of judgment. But notice that even in his perplexity, he chooses to cling to God's holy and faithful nature. Let us learn from Habakkuk here. That yes, he's confused and he's perplexed and he doesn't understand, but he's going to continue to cling on to God by faith. Because he understands that God is holy and God is faithful. And so he's struggling a bit. You know, he, he sees these things. Why, God, do you allow this? These things are bothering him. But at the same time, he knows that God is holy and faithful. And he finds an anchor in God, his rock, the mighty God. The picture is of a rock, something he can hold on to, stability. The nation will not be fully wiped out, he recognizes, because God's going to be faithful to his covenant. He's trying to remind himself, at least I think here, reminding himself of truths about God that he can cling to. This is why it's so important. And in, in, in Faith Baptist Church in Sunday School, we're looking at the, really the attributes of God. We've been studying the Lord Jesus and God the Father. And we're, we're doing an in-depth study of them because we need a right and solid doctrine of who God is. Because we're going to have many things come into our life that we just don't understand. And we shake our head and we can get discouraged and we just don't understand. And when that happens, you've got to know who your God is. And you've got to cling to him when we don't understand. It's so important to know the character of God. In verse 13, thou art a purer eyes than to behold evil. And canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously. And holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. Now he's going back to his confusion. Again, he recognizes God's holiness. But this confuses him even more. Because why will God put up with these things? And why would God then send the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, who are so much more wicked than they are? How can God tolerate all this and do this? So we see again a perplexed faith. I don't think it's a failing faith. It's just a perplexed faith. He's just struggling like we can at times. God's sovereign actions are just confusing to him. And often are confusing to us. Verse 14. And make us men as the fishes of the sea, as the creeping things that have no ruler over them. He complains that God made people like the fish of the sea who are helpless. And they, they're helpless to all the powerful predators around them. He says they have no ruler, sea creatures with no way to take care of themselves. It seems as if he's placing the blame on God for the mistreatment of the conquered. He's again struggling a bit here. But then verse 15. They take up all of them with the angle. They catch them in their net and gather them in their drag. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. He's again explaining the Babylonians as they are taking captives. He says they take captives like the fishermen do. When they're, when they're going after the catch, they'll use hooks. And they'll use nets and they'll gather in the fish. And, and they'll do what they want with the fish. They'll take them back and they'll... they'll uh, eventually process them and eat them and the other things they'll do. And he says, he, he looks at that picture, he says, the Babylonians, they're just taking us like we're fish in the sea. 
Now it's interesting, there are some Babylonian monuments that depict uh, a picture like what is portrayed in verse 15. Uh, they depict Chaldeans uh, dr driving a hook through the lower lip of their captives and stringing them single foul like fish on a line and just marching them along. There's also other reliefs that show the Chaldeans pictured their major gods dragging a net in which their captured enemies are squirming within the nets as they're dragging them along. So we have depictions of, of the Babylonians doing this kind of thing. In verse 16, therefore they sacrifice unto their net and they burn incense unto their drag because by them their portion is fat and their meat plenteous. The Babylonians give credit to the tools of their trade. They're not going to get God to credit. They, they, they look to the tools of the trade and they worship their nets and, and they, they continue on. In verse 17, shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? Then the prophet, he's basically asking, will this cruelty continue on? How long will it go? And it's almost as if he says to God, will you not interrupt this? Will you just allow this cruelty to continue on? So again, the prophet is baffled. How can God use the Babylonians? They're so cruel. And yet God chose to use them to judge Israel. Now, I'm going to include here chapter 1. Tag and Joseph may, I mean chapter 2, verse 1. And he may cover this again and very well may. But I do think it kind of goes with chapter 1. And so we find the prophet confused, and we find the prophet here struggling. And so now in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower, and will watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. He's willing to wait for God to speak. He's anticipating the answer now. And he wants to see how God will answer him. Waiting can be difficult, but it is worth it. God will answer us. He will guide and direct us and teach us in his timing. But he is expecting an answer here. He desires God to answer. He wants God to answer. Now, I want to say this real quickly, and, and uh, there's other pastors here, and they may not agree with this, and, and Tagan may not agree with this, and that's fine. You study it out for yourself. But many of the commentators at the end of verse 1 of chapter 2, it says there, and I shall wait for an answer when I am reproved. Now many do not like the, the word reproved here. And the idea is that he'll, they're just waiting for the answer that God will give to him. But I wonder, this word reproved in the Hebrew the word that is used here is primarily used of correcting some wrong. That is the majority of the use of this particular word. And, and I here's my thoughts, and, and others can disprove them, disagree, that's fine. But being that this word often is used for correction or some wrong, is it possible? Is it possible that Habakkuk might be saying, Lord, I know I'm struggling. And maybe he's humbling himself to realize that he has this confusion that he's portraying a certain thing about God, but maybe at the same time he's realizing this thought can't be right. It is impossible he's waiting for God to answer him and to correct him and help him with his perplexity and his confusion. That in his humility he realizes, I can't be right about all this, but I'm struggling. God, answer me. Now, there are other ways to look at that. I just throw that out there. But what do we see in chapter 1? We see a very confused, struggling prophet. He has knowledge of who God is, and yet at the same time, he's very confused. Why all of this evil? And then, why of all things are you going to use the Chaldeans to judge us? So what can we glean from this this evening? A few principles just to, to, to end with tonight. Number one, God hears our prayers. He may seem silent, but God always hears. We're his children. He listens. He hears. But we must learn to trust in his timing. He doesn't always answer right away. But we can trust him in spite of the time we think God should answer. 
And when God answers, and his timing will always be the very best. Keep on praying. Never give up praying. Just because you feel that maybe God is not listening, keep on praying. Number two, bring your complaints and confusion to God. I really don't believe God does, I don't believe God minds that we do that. If we do it with a humble heart, a teachable spirit, bring your complaints and your confusion to God. Talk to God about these things. Admit to God you're struggling and you don't understand. It doesn't make sense, but I don't believe God minds our complaints and our confusion as long as we have the right attitude. Number three, God will discipline those he loves. And he will get our attention one way or another. We need to heed his warnings. That means today in your personal reading of scripture, as you have your private devotions, heed God's warnings. Through the preaching and teaching of God's word, heed the warnings. Guard your heart from straying from God. But God will discipline. He will chase it. But as we know from Hebrews chapter 13, that's a good thing. He chastens us because he loves us. But God disciplines those he loves. Number four. Can you let God be God? Just let God be God. Can you rest in him when things don't make sense to you? Can you still rest in him? When evil seems out of control, when good people suffer and we just don't get it, when there seems to be no justice, and aren't we there? We look out, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of justice out there today. Let us determine to trust in God's character. Trust in God's power. And most of all, trust in God's wisdom. Because he's all wise and he knows what he's doing. Again, we do not have to understand everything. We, we can't. We don't have to. We just need to submit to God and to trust him. And so can we trust him? God knows what he's doing. And as we work through the, the we, the other pastors, work through the rest of this book. We're going to see that journey him back in time. But he's learning to walk with a strength in faith. So we see a perplexed faith. Again, it's not a failing faith. It's, it's a perplexed faith. But he is maturing. He is growing. Chapter 3 is a, a great chapter. Can't wait to see how our men unfold that one for us. But my friends, let God be God. And trust in his wisdom. Let's pray. Father, we need your help. We're weak. And Father, at times we have many questions. And many perplexities. And many confusions. But Father, strengthen our faith in you. Our knowledge about who you are. So that when the trials come and the perplexities come. We can still trust you. But Father, we're weak. We need your help. We need strength. We need reminders. We need each other to come alongside and to encourage. And so strengthen our faith, Father, that even while perplexed, we can still call out to you. We can still trust you. And we still can find peace in resting in who you are and how you work. Help us, Father, we pray. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.